Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first session um, of the day. You made it to the last day of ApacheCon. Um, the first talk this morning will be by Steve Hamrick talking about the future of Traffic Portal. Take it away, Steve. Thanks. Uh, so as Dave said, uh, this talk is the future of Traffic Portal. Uh, my name is Steve Hamrick. Uh, so a bit about myself, uh, I've been, I'm a software engineer over at Comcast. I've been on the CDN team for about three years. Uh, in my spare time, I like to go bouldering and hiking. I'm also a pretty big gamer. Uh, so a bit about this talk. Um, when I originally submitted this, I was hoping that we are going to be farther along in the implementation of uh, Traffic Portal than we actually are. So as a result, this is going to be a lot more high level and more talking about the specific features of Angular and what it can bring, as opposed to actually showing off, uh, you know, how the new traffic portal is going to look. Uh, the, the new traffic portal does exist, and I will show a demo of it later, but it's still very much in its infancy. Uh, and before I continue, there's also some uh, nomenclature that I should get out of the way. Uh, when I am referring to the old traffic portal, I'll be calling it Traffic Portal V1. And for the new traffic portal, I'll call it V2, Traffic Portal V2, that is. Um, when I'm talking about Angular, uh, Angular JS and Angular 1, that will be the old Angular that is getting removed in the future. And for the new Angular, I'll just refer to it as Angular or Angular 2. Uh, it's always been stuck in my mind as Angular 2 for whatever reason. And then finally, um, if you ever hear my mic cut off or whatever, that probably just means I'm muting myself to take a drink or catch my breath or hopefully uh, to avoid my dog barking. Uh, we'll see. He likes to bark, so hopefully that won't be too bad. Uh, but so in this talk, I'm going to be going over the current state of Traffic Portal. Um, then we'll be talking about uh, the high-level overview of what the new Angular uh, brings to the table, uh, what kind of things it can do. Uh, the tech stack it brings, and then we'll also be going into some comparisons. Uh, so a brief overview of the agenda. We'll, we'll talk about V1 and its tech stack, the Angular, the history of Angular, uh, the new Angular the comparison overview, what you get out of the box, and stuff like that. Uh, and then I have a demo of the new traffic portal lined up, as well as uh, some examples of what you can expect from the new Angular and the kind of things you can do uh, with it. And then finally, I'll finish up with uh, Q and A. Uh, so first off, uh, Traffic Portal V1 is built using uh, Angular JS jQuery underscore Flot SCSS. Uh, Flot is our charting library that we use, um, or I, I guess we also use Chart.js as well. Um, one the impetus behind this entire rewrite, quote unquote, it's kind of half of a rewrite since it's the same framework, uh, is that Angular JS is end of life at the end of this year. And it was actually supposed to already be end of life, but thanks to everybody's favorite disease, um, they pushed it back farther. So lucky for us, we got some extra time. Uh, and so the build system for Traffic Portal V1 is actually pretty uh, complicated and it's kind of convoluted as well. Uh, and, and you know, before I start digging into Traffic Portal V1, I just want to say it's not really the fault of the developers who worked on it. You know, they did a great job. It's really, if, if I'm blaming anybody, it's the 2010 development web development ecosystem where, you know, it's very wild west where you have to figure everything out yourself and get everything working yourself and all these features uh, you need to do yourself. So as an example of that, uh, Traffic Portal V1 uses a custom build system. Uh, for package management, we use NPM and Bower. Uh, I put an asterisk next to Bower since uh, as of a couple of weeks ago, that's actually been removed and everything is managed through NPM, uh, but it makes a stronger case if I include it here, so I did. Um, and then the actual build system is orchestrated through Grunt, and this runs many different steps, Compass, Browserify, HTML, 2.js, cache busting, and more. Uh, so if we go look at... Uh, how the current build is. So I'm in I'm in our repo. This is essentially uh, what is available on GitHub right now. Uh, in the traffic portal folder, you'll see we have these JSN files, which you know that's essentially a, a replacement for a linter. 
except it's very it's pretty unflexible and it's also uh, doesn't it's not enforced. Uh, we have our gem file, which uh, for the Ruby devs out there, this is our uh, Ruby dependency management. And you might be asking, why do we need Ruby for our traffic portal? And the reason for that is Compass, which is our SCSS compiler. Uh, and this part right here actually significantly increases the developer build time and the difficulty with actually getting a developer environment set up just because you have to install Ruby just for this one thing. Uh, and then there's also this grunt file. And so this grunt file is kind of like our overall uh, build orchestration. So, you know, it, we register all of our tasks and we define uh, what we want to do. Uh, and so if you look at the grunt folder up here, this is where all those tasks are defined and configured. And as you can tell, there's quite a bit of files and we have to manage this all of ourselves. So, you know, if something gets deprecated or maybe there's a security issue, we have to go dig in through all the things and get that working. and make sure it works with our tech stack and all that. Uh, and you know what you don't see here is the bower.json and the bowerrc or files, which uh, that's just another package manager that was deprecated. And you know, just to give you an idea of why having to build your own uh, or build your own build system is a problem. So we're, I'm looking in the package.json, which is the NPM dependencies. Uh, so we have our dev dependencies, but if you look at these dependencies down here, which are just uh, the uh, normal build dependencies, uh, all the ones that are listed here were things that were in Bower that got moved over for the most part. There's a couple of them that aren't. Uh, and so, you know, Bower is deprecated. And so what that means is, you know, for a couple of these, we actually had to upgrade our libraries because NPM didn't even have, we were using such unsupported versions of uh, packages that we had to upgrade. And you know that ends up causing us some problems. So for instance, we had to upgrade jQuery. And it turns out in that upgrade, what they had done is they changed from, uh, I forget exactly what it was, but they switched their module system from like AMD to common JS or something like that. And that actually is runs uh, counter to how our current build system works with Browserify, because it always assumed it was the same module types, uh, which it wasn't. So you know that's a headache we had to solve, and that's just because we're building, or using our own build system. Uh, so some history about Angular JS. It was started uh, by Google in 2010, I believe, maybe 2011. Uh, the first beta release was in 2011. Um, one of the one of the big selling points of Angular JS was that it was a single page application, and so for those of you not familiar, essentially what that means is, in a traditional web app, uh, when you when you go through internal links, every time you navigate to a new page, you'd have to completely reload the page. Now that includes all the shared code, including like your header, your sidebar, you know, all your styling components, your CSS, and you know that can when you start getting big apps, that can start adding up quite a bit. So a single page application, the idea is kind of you load once and then you just load the new stuff as you need it. And that's actually where a lot of the performance improvements that AngularJS had over regular web development stuff uh, came in. Uh, it's completely open source. You can go look on GitHub right now and view all the source code if you wanted. Uh, you know, as a result of this, there's actually companies that are offering uh, support past the official end of life by Google. Uh, so, you know, that's always an option as well. Uh, AngularJS is a JavaScript framework. Uh, it's kind of, it's more of a library than a framework. I, I, I like to refer to it as it's a framework built like a library. And what I mean by that is, you know, you just include Angular and then you're left to your own devices. You have to go figure everything else out yourself. You know, most frameworks have opinions on stuff. AngularJS doesn't. It lets you do whatever you want. And as a result, you can get some really crazy things going on. Uh, as the years went by, you know, AngularJS started to fall behind the other frameworks for multiple reasons. You know, the web development ecosystem changes so fast that, uh, you know, a rewrite of Angular is essentially needed. But, you know, so the, the main two areas where Angular fell behind is performance. So first off is performance since Angular is a single page application. It uh, has quite a bit of spin up time and there's a lot of, uh, heavy lifting going on behind the scenes that you have to handle. Uh, and the other reason that Angular started to fall behind other frameworks is the tooling. And so, you know, when Angular first came out, it was great because you could uh, template and uh, 
you know, mock designs really quickly. Uh, but I didn't really have tooling for it. And so as other more mature or I guess, yeah, more mature projects came out that had better tooling, you know, Angular started losing its edge. And to solve all these issues, they went for a rewrite, which we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, but so at a high level, Angular introduces a bunch of new concepts. Uh, so first off, if you're a developer going to the new Angular, the first thing you'll notice is that they've ditched the model view controller design completely, uh, which, you know, so the, the model is where you define your bindings and the scope and things like that. The view is just your template file and the controller is, you know, where your component or directive is. Uh, so as a result, this means that scope and obviously controllers are gone. Uh, so sc technically the scope isn't completely gone. There's still a root scope. Uh, but other than that, for the most part, scope is pretty much completely gone, which, you know, that sounds like a big change, but it actually uh, results in a lot of uh, changes that make it faster as well as easier to work with. Uh, the new, the new uh, Angular is based entirely around directives, structural and attributive. Uh, so an attributive directive, you know, that's just an HTML attribute. Uh, so if I want to bind a user to a button or something like that, uh, you know, that's an att attributive directive. And then the structural directives are just, uh, you know, what you'd normally expect from a HTML element, components or whatnot. Uh, the new Angular is now a proper framework. Uh, so it has its own ecosystem. It has a, a command line tool, which is quite good. And if you try to do Angular development without it, you're going to have a bad time. Um, it has its own build system. You know, all the stuff that I listed for the TPV1, you know, I'm, for the most part, all of that stuff comes out of the box. And for the stuff that doesn't come out of the box, you can relatively easily uh, get it working by usually uncommenting a couple lines, depending on what it is, and just installing an NPM package. Uh, it has much better built-in support for accessibility. So, you know, things like uh, blind, blind or colorblind, things like that, uh, that's built in more. Uh, it has better mobile and legacy browser support. So, I mean, you could do polyfills before, but again, it comes out of the box with polyfills and it's very easy to add stuff. So for instance, um, you know, Angular doesn't work on Internet Explorer, anything before 11. I don't know if there's a 12, I don't think so, but you can include polyfills, so it does. Uh, and on top of that, you can also include polyfills for specific, for mobile browsers. So you can do, you know, you can, uh, shim your browser events to be more friendly for mobile, even though you didn't actually do them yourself. Uh, one, you know, th this isn't technically strictly tr uh, new to the new Angular, but there's modules. You know, AngularJS uses modules, but the way uh, Angular 2 uses modules is much more fleshed out and it makes a lot more sense. Uh, and as a result, you can also do dynamic loading of modules. That's also something you can do with AngularJS, but again, you kind of have to finagle that yourself and it can be quite a nightmare. Uh, there are some other things like asynchronous template compilation, which, you know, again, that improves performance. There's better callbacks uh, using RxJS, which is, you know, that's just a JavaScript library that, uh, you know, it better encapsul encapsulates how the uh, background processes of JavaScript actually work, and it's much easier to hook into their life cycle events directly and whatnot. Uh, one important thing that they've decided to go with is uh, they use semantic versioning, uh, and also they aim for a six-month release cadence. So that release cadence is important because, you know, if, if you remember when I was talking about AngularJS, one of the reasons it fell behind, it fell behind because the web development ecosystem is changing so much. So the six month release cadence, and so by six month release cadence, I mean every six months they aim for a new major version. And obviously they don't always hit it. They're usually off by a month or two, but in general, every six months there's a new major version. And th this allows them to keep up with web development standards without having to do a, a another Angular rewrite, so to speak. Um, there's new binding and expression syntax, which this is probably some of the uh, most exciting part for a developer, in my opinion. Uh, I'll show some some examples of that later. And then also uh, it includes TypeScript, which I will talk about that later as well. It actually extensively uses TypeScript. Uh, you don't, I don't think you need to, 
but a lot of the performance improvements that come with the new Angular are because of how the TypeScript compiler actually works. So out of the box, you get semantic versioning, TypeScript, uh, SCSS, which is a uh, CSS framework. Uh, you get a complete build system. You have the Angular CLI, which handles just about everything you could want. Uh, it comes with unit and end to end testing out of the box, which is very useful as that's usually something that gets overlooked and is harder to add later. Uh, and there's more to it. So if we are looking at semantic versioning, uh, now this, these timelines are roughly to scale. Uh, they line up almost, they don't really because it was hard to fit on one slide, but the top is the Angular JS history uh, and the bottom is the Angular history. So with Angular JS, you can see they kind of didn't, their versions didn't really mean anything. They were just upping the number whenever they had a new release. Uh, you know, you could have breaking changes in a minor uh, quote unquote, if we're talking semantic version and semantic versioning, uh, you could have breaking changes there. Uh, their, their release was kind of all over the place. They didn't really have a specific time. Uh, and then in 2016 is when they actually released the first version of the Angular rewrite. And the first thing you'll notice is that they have a release about every six months. You know, I mean, obviously there are some exceptions and things get in the way and whatnot. Uh, but that is uh, one nice thing, you know, for instance, the original Angular compiler came out with V2, but in, I think it was V7, maybe V8, uh, they introduced the IV compiler, which actually had a significant amount of performance improvements and, and you know, it really helps the Angular ecosystem. I'll, I'll talk about that more in a bit. Uh, and then one other thing you might notice is uh, down here, they skipped version three. They just did that for, I, I don't remember, that was such a long time ago. They did it for, to, they had some issue matching versions on all their libraries and repos they were running or something like that. Uh, so a bit about TypeScript. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, it is made by Microsoft. It is open source software. It is a superset of JavaScript. It transpiles to JavaScript, excuse me, and it introduces type safety. And I put safety in quotes because if you know what you're doing, you can actually get around it. Uh, as more versions of TypeScript have come out, it's gotten harder and harder to do so. And on top of that, uh, TypeScript has, you can do some pretty interesting linting things, which allow us to uh, help guarantee type safety. You know, you can avoid the pitfalls where you can trick the Angular, or the Angular, the TypeScript compiler. And so, oops. So if we go look at our current, uh, linter. So this is this is uh, the experimental traffic portal, traffic portal two. I'll I'll show you where you can see this and all that later. But as you can see, you can have a bunch of different linter options, and the way it works is you have these standard linter rules and then you can extend them and change them how you want. So for instance, up here, we have the Angular ESLint rules and you know we can change them as we want. I don't think these are actually different than the defaults, but I, it doesn't matter. The point is, is you can do some really nice stuff with uh, ESLint. Uh, so the Angular build system. Uh, so Angular introduced the compiler and so normally you just have the Angular runtime, but the uh, compiler is what is what allows Angular to be so much faster, as well as it helps with the tooling, and it it's it's great. I'll I'll talk more about that in a couple of slides. Um, it has built-in support for internationalization, which is to say, you know, if if you want to support different languages, you can do that pretty easily. It does it has support of that out of the box. Now it's, it's worth mentioning that this probably isn't something that would be in TP v2 because you kind of have to design your app around that and uh, Apache traffic control in general is not designed around that so but it, if, if we ever decide to do that it's possible from the UI standpoint uh, and as I mentioned earlier they introduce polyfills uh, so if we go look at our 
current or the Angular T, uh, Angular version two polyfills. Uh, so you know, first off, you can see we're importing this class list.js, which in this, what this does is it allows us to run IE10 and IE11 code. And it's worth mentioning this polyfill.ts file. This is auto generated. This it's automatically included in. If you don't want any polyfills, you can just comment out all this code uh, if you want, and it won't support browsers that don't support them. You know, we have uh, web animation JS, which supports web animation specific web animations you can do in Angular on browsers that don't support it. Uh, you know, and you have things like Hammer JS, and what Hammer JS is is it's kind of like a shim to help convert desktop usability into mobile. So you know, it makes when you're when we're developing this, you know, it'll be for desktop and. So all the events and the way things work will be based on mouse movement, but mouse and touchscreen is quite different. And so what HammerJS does is it allows you to uh, not have to worry about your mobile experience as much. Now, um, one the another thing that the Angular build system has is it has a built-in bundler. You know we're using Browserify and Traffic Portal V1. Uh, I believe Angular uses uh, Webpack these days. And so, you know, that does a whole bunch of stuff for us. You know, it does cache busting. It it uh, minifies and uglifies our files if we want it to. Um, it, uh... Oh, yeah, it also reduces the number of files you have until the, until the least, until, the, until you only have what you need. And, you know, so that way you're not requesting a thousand files just because it's how your project is set up. Um, you know, it has mo uh, mobile browser support. Again, that's not really something we're probably going to be aiming for with Traffic Portal V2, I imagine. But I, it, with the Angular build system, it's it should be something that works. It probably won't be a nice experience, and it probably won't be very enjoyable, but it, it should work. Uh, and obviously, it does translation and compilation uh, with SCSS and TypeScript. So uh, talking a bit about the Angular command line uh, interface, it encompasses the entire ecosystem and that's important because there's a lot of stuff that Angular is doing behind the scenes and the CLI is what enables us to not have to worry about all the build systems and our package managers and whatnot like we do with Tracker Portal V1. Uh, you know, with, with the Angular CLI, it can do pretty much anything you want. So if you need to make a new project, it does that, sets up everything for you, uses its uh, sensible defaults. Uh, you can generate components, services, you know, whatever you need. And whenever it does this, it, it generates everything you need. If, if, if you build your app correctly, it can even hook up the routing for you as well as put it in the right module. Uh, the other thing the Angular CLI does is it handles updates or upgrades. And that's actually one of my favorite uh, features of it is, you know, the NPM, updating NPM packages is actually a real pain in the butt, uh, especially when you have a big app with multiple, uh, you know, with uh, multiple dependencies and each one requires a different version. And, you know, they even made, so on top of that, uh, they even have this website, update.angular.io which will, you know, you, you select what versions you're on, some things, you're, what, what you're using, the complexity, and it'll show you all the things that are broke and all the things you should know about when changing. And so, you know, this on top of, so you see ng update right there, that command is what actually uh, does the updating. And it's as simple as that, kind of. Uh, but yeah, so they've built this whole uh, ecosystem around ng update, which makes updating significantly easier. Uh, and then also it has schematics. And so you can kind of think of schematics as just a way of customizing what the Angular CLI does. So for instance, if I don't like the unit testing framework it chooses, you could uh, make a schematic to change the UI testing framework. Uh, so a bit about the Angular tooling. Uh, a lot of what it has is in the UI and is actually quite useful. Uh, so you have material. And so material is kind of two different things. Uh, it's all maintained and managed by Google, which has the benefit of that when there's a new Angular update. Oh, I, I, hold on, I'll get there in a sec. Uh, so you have material design, which is kind of just like the design guidelines that Google has made. And you know, if you look at like YouTube, you'll see that it uses material design. 
Uh, and then on top of that, they built Angular Material, which is the Angular implementation of Material specs. Uh, and they actually, if you go to the Angular website, you know, you can see you have all these different components that you can use. And they, the, the great thing about this is, you know, they, they support, they, they come out of the box and they're supporting as, about as much as you could want. So you don't have to worry about, uh, I mean, technically you do have to worry about responsiveness, but out of the box, it does it relatively well. Um, if you, you know, it even has guides. So if you just want to use material design, but not necessarily material UI, you could follow the guidelines. And then on top of that, you know, the chances that you find something that doesn't actually have a component for it is pretty high. So they made this component dev kit. And this is essentially just a bunch of building blocks. Uh, they actually use these in, these, in, in their components. And these building blocks allow you to make your own uh, UI components without having to rebuild the wheel. So to speak, um, Angular has built-in uh, layout support. So you, there's FX layout or flex layout. I forget what it's called. Uh, if you don't want to, if you're using browsers that don't support grid, uh, which was actually really nice. Uh, it also has built-in grid support, which is great. Uh, there's forms, so it actually has two different modules for forms. There's reactive forms, and it, I don't remember what the other one's called, uh, but they. So you have your choice of how you want to do forms, because it turns out forms is actually pretty, it's a simple concept, but it's actually pretty hard in uh, execution. Uh, also, it has built-in support for animations. And so if you think about uh, CSS animations, first you have to make the CSS yourself, and then also you have to do the state management. With uh, how Angular does it, you can actually, the state management is kind of built in. You still kind of have to do it yourself, but it's a lot easier. And you don't actually have to, well, it, you don't have to write CSS, but it's technically CSS behind the things get designed behind the scenes. I mentioned the component developer kit and then schematics to allow you to change uh, whatever you like about uh, your Angular project. So testing, anytime you use the Angular CLI to generate anything, it will create tests for you. And that's super nice. And not only that, but it does unit tests and end-to-end -end tests. Uh, for unit tests, it uses Karma for end-to-end -end tests, Protractor. Uh, the end Protractor is actually deprecated. And so they're going to be switching off of uh, protracted to something else. They haven't, I, last I checked, they haven't actually decided on what they're going to move to. Uh, but, you know, people have made uh, schematics specifically to uh, switch the different end-to-end -end tests for you, which just shows you, you know, the usefulness of schematics. So talking about the Angular compiler, this is where a lot of the magic and uh, performance improvements come from. Uh, so the client has no knowledge of this step. Uh, it converts templates from uh, declarative into imperative code. And so, you know, I, that, I always get confused with declarative and imperative, what you mean. So on the top here, we have, uh, we have declarative. Uh, so, you know, we have a component that we define with some directive attached to it. But, you know, that's not actually what your uh, browser is going to read. What it's going to read is in this imperative code. You know, we have document.create element, and then we go instantiate the component, and yada, yada, yada. Um, and so that, so the compiler does that step for us. Previously, uh, you would have to do that on the client side uh, in the old Angular. And I believe technically you can actually, don't, you don't even have to use the Angular compiler in the new Angular, but you absolutely should because that's just, it's free performance. Uh, you know, the compiler has the obvious benefits that any compiler would have. It can do automatic optimizations. Uh, it can do uh, type checking and whatnot. Uh, so in general, there's JIT and AOT. So just in time and ahead of time compilation. The runtime does just in time compilation. Uh, and so that's that's what it was doing before. And if you're running it in uh, as a developer, it's usually that's usually what it's using as well. And then the compiler does a ahead of time compilation. So if you see here this diagram, uh, those of you that are familiar with TypeScript will probably recognize this as it looks quite familiar. 
And that's because the Angular compiler hooks directly into the TypeScript uh, compile pipeline and leverages it quite heavily to make uh, improvements. These uh, asterisk steps are the ones that Angular inserts. So with program creation, that's just the discovery of all the TypeScript files, reads in the TypeScript config so it knows exactly how you want your TypeScript uh, directory structured and whatnot. Uh, it then moves on to the Angular step, which is analyze. And this is what this is doing is it's just going over TypeScript code and it's looking for Angular components it's, or Angular. Uh, I, I use components interchangeably. Angular uh, components is a thing in Angular, but I just mean that in general here. Uh, but so it just searches for those. It doesn't actually do any processing. As you know, it's entirely possible that you, in this step, you'd come across something that hasn't even been defined yet. Uh, and then you have the resolve step. And the resolve step will take all that analyze, all the stuff that it analyzed and actually start doing the resolution with, uh, you know, OK, we have this component here that I don't know. It's registered in our ng modules. So we're actually going to use this one and whatnot. Uh, it then goes on to the regular TypeScript type checking. And it actually does uh, some additional Angular type checking here, which is really nice because it can catch some, you know, a lot of times. Uh, in Angular JS would would uh, just fail quote unquote silently if you you know misspelled something or you didn't improperly include all the libraries that you needed or maybe you didn't include it in your module definition uh, and then finally emission that's that's pretty self-explanatory step you know that's transpilation and then the output of all the files uh, so for server side rendering or let me rephrase. Angular also introduces server-side rendering. So on top of the compiler, uh, you can render, you can do a partial rendering of the page, of whatever page you're loading on the server. Uh, and so this is, you know, you can kind of think of this as just doing the first couple steps of the Angular runtime. Uh, and so this will improve start, uh, performance for you because the client doesn't have to do that. And also it allows you to do some interesting things where, you know, you can, have services that are opaque to the user that you don't want them to know about. Or perhaps, you know, I want to make uh, database queries without actually, you know, from, from the server, because supposedly that should be quicker to the database server from the UI server than it is from the client. And so what the user ends up with is a semi-processed uh, file that the Angular runtime can then take and start working on. So we'll go into a demo. So the first thing, um, this code, so this is the uh, GitHub for traffic control. Uh, all this code lives under experimental and then traffic dash portal. Uh, and you can see all this here. It, it's there, ready to go. Ideally, you should be able to get it to run. Uh, you know, this is pretty, uh, just the groundwork level stuff has been completed. There's, you know, still a bunch of work to do and whatnot. Uh, but most most of this work has been done by uh, Ocket for eights, as as he liked to be referred to. Uh, so he's done a great job with that. But yeah, actually going into the demo. So uh, I guess it's also worth mentioning that since this is so early, you know, there's a lot of most of the things here aren't really finalized. Uh, you know, it's just really the foundational stuff. So if you see something like, oh, that looks bad, or you know, I want it to work this way, I wouldn't fret too much. And on top of that, I've also made quite a few changes to the code just specifically for this demo. Uh, most of the time, those changes aren't really logical, but uh, yeah, uh, I, I made them just for the purpose, uh, sake of demo purposes. Uh, so if you log in, right, you brought to the dashboard, and so these are delivery services, and you know you have your delivery service uh, details, and you have your charts. Uh, you can view the details of these and see whatnot, uh, you know, you have users where you can see all the users and then you have servers where, and you know, this, if you're familiar with traffic portal V1, this table looks familiar to you. And that's because it's the same library we're using behind the scenes. Uh, so that's nice. Uh, they, we also have this fuzzy search, which is really cool. So, you know, you don't actually have to specify what column you're searching for. So, you know, I want CCR, which is Comcast router, or, you know, I want to search for specifically for an IP address. It can do that all for you. So that's pretty nifty. Uh, there's also an, your own admin page where you can, you know, create users and whatnot. But yeah, so that's that's pretty much the the, the simple 
the the short of it. Uh, it actually it's using a lot of different things behind the scenes. So first off, uh, we're going to talk about uh, modules. So if we look at the network tab, when we load, there's these four JavaScript files. When hey, we hey Steve, just a five minute warning. Cool, thanks. Uh, after we log in, it loads this core dash core dot module js file. And that, that's that lazy loading module stuff that I was talking about before. And that's actually a really cool uh, feature because it, you know, if, if you have specific admin code that you don't want any user, uh, then it's, uh, it, you know, you don't have to worry about them getting that code. Uh, the other benefit of this is that it also can improve load times, you know, where, where, we're open source, so it doesn't really matter for us. But you know, supposedly, if you wanted to have your own specific, you know, for Comcast, you know, maybe we want our own page for, you know, our our uh, DevOps people, then we could add that, and it wouldn't wouldn't be loaded to any user who doesn't have permission. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, I was planning on showing a couple more things, but given that I'm almost out of time, I figured I'd I'd, I'd call it here and then. Uh, ask if anyone has any questions or anything. That's not the slide I'm on. That's the slide. I I I I call them Ocket Four Eight because saying eight four times is really hard, and I always lose track. Any more questions? Polyfill is just uh, so. If you think of, I, I don't, I can't think of a specific example here, but you know, Internet Explorer is the main offender where it doesn't actually support the ECMAScript standard. And so, for instance, you know, like there, I I don't remember exactly what it was, but you know, there's a version of Internet Explorer where you can't do like for loops. Uh, how you would normally, and you know that breaks like everything in half. And so a polyfill essentially does, hey, are you using Internet Explorer? All right, well here's a function that uh, does that for loop for you, so you don't have to worry the, about the fact that the browser doesn't actually support all the things it should. All right. <clears throat> well, if there are no more questions, then thank you, Steve. That was a great presentation. Great. Thanks. I'll be posting these slides in uh, uh, the Apache Slack soon if you wanted to see the stuff that I didn't get to demo. The slides don't really have any of the information there, but you can see what I was planning on at least. <laughs>